Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to speak to how many young people we have here? There we go. Uh, everybody's young. I like it that way. I, that's what I was hoping for. Um, I, I want to speak to you about uh, the spirit of wisdom, but it's the second uh, message on, on the spirit of wisdom. But, but I want to focus this morning on, on the millennial wisdom. You know, there's a lot of people that are down on the millennials. And I think maybe we need to rethink that idea. Because at some point in time, I can assure you, if you're a little bit uh, older like I am, I know I'm older than, than some, but uh, my parents did not understand me. How many of you know your parents did not understand you when you were growing up either? They thought you were a little uh, out there. Well, the young people are saying, yeah. No, this is not to give you a license for that. But, but I want you to think about it because God's going to take the, the, what we think is at risk and turn it into a miracle of breakthrough for this, for this country. And we do need to pray for this nation to experience a revival of God's presence like never before. So, so I want you to uh, consider, as, as you look at this scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, I'll put it out here on the screen. I, I talked last week more about the hidden wisdom. Today, I want to speak about the mystery wisdom. The word mystery here means, in the Greek, is mysterium, which means it's a hidden term to be revealed at the specific time when the war council releases that. So it's almost a military term that is used in 1 Corinthians 2. And, and think of it this way. Paul says, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. This is the mysterium. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory Wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. So consider this. Here's the Pharisees. Here's the enemy. They're saying, if we can just get of this guy, get rid of this guy that's healing the sick, casting out demons, doing all this stuff, if we could just get rid of him, let's kill him. Except that on the third day, he rose from the dead and created a bigger mess than they anticipated because now there were thousands of Christians filled with wisdom, filled with the Spirit, filled with the resurrection life. And it was a bunch of many Jesus, if I could say it that way. And, and they didn't know how to handle them. That's what the book of Acts is all about. We saw last week they couldn't even cope with the wisdom with which uh, Stephen spoke. But last week we spoke about this uh, wisdom, the hidden wisdom is more going into the deep, pulling the depths of wisdom, right? Today is more of a what is the war assignment? What is the, the tactical purpose of this wisdom? Well, let me ask you a question. If I mention these names, I'm going to mention three names. Tell me if you recognize them. Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah. How many of you know who they are? Oh, wow, that's good. Most people don't know who they are because it's their Hebrew name. We, we know them by their Babylonian name, which is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, think about this, because when you were born, God gave you an identity. Can I get one amen? amen. God gave you a purpose. Culture, the enemy is to constantly try to rewire that identity and purpose. In fact, in this story, it goes so far 
to bring the point that the enemy, in this particular case, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to take their name and change their name, hoping he changes their identity. But he fails in that. And as much as you think that the enemy is stealing the identity of the millennials, the identity of, of Christians, God is saying, I will have the last say so in this matter. God is writing your story, and he knows how to finish it. So if you would, go with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. And I want to speak to some of our young people. How many of you have kids here that, that are a little bit younger than you are? <laughs> if you don't, we need to have a talk afterwards. <laughs> but here's the story of four kids that were taken out of their home. Now consider this. Hold on before you read that. Hold on. Four kids that were taken out of their home. There may be 14, some writers say 15, 16 years old. They are taken into captivity into Babylon. And in Babylon, they change their names. And, and here's what it says about these four kids. I start in verse 4. These youth, speaking about these four young men, in whom was no defect, were good-looking. Man, they look like me. <laughs> no, I have plenty of defects. But l listen to how, how it's written. There was no defect in them. They were good-looking. They were intelligent. In every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge, and they had the ability to serve the king in their courts, in his courts. And they order him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Verse 5. And the king appointed them for daily rations, for the king's choice food, and from the wine and the, and which he drank, he and, appointed, and he appointed that they should be educated three years, and at the end of which they were to enter into the king's personal service. Think about this. Here they are. God seems to know that they're going to go through a journey the enemy thinks he's going to get rid of the Hebrew culture, destroy their identity, and put the Babylonian identity on them. For all purposes, their future is gone. But I would say, but God. So as much as we look at our, at our younger people today or, or, or whoever you look at, or maybe your own life, you may think, well, but I'm going through this, and I've given up this, and I've compromised here, and, I, and I've my identity is changing. I don't even know what God has called me to do. Could it be possible that the enemy is trying to rewire who God made you to be? So I want you to look at the names, because when you put the names from the Hebrew to the Babylonian meaning... I laugh at this because I thought, and this was the thought that came to me, and I thought, what if the enemy tried to erase what God, did, what God started, and in the process of trying to erase what God started, they just added to what God started in exactly what he did. Listen to what the word Daniel means. Daniel means God is my judge. But when his name is changed to the Babylonian name, Belshazzar, means the Lord of treasure. So if I put it together, 
Would it read, God is my judge and the Lord of all my treasures? He's not destroying their identity. He's adding to their identity. You see, Satan may be trying to rewire your identity, but God knows the hidden wisdom and the mysterious wisdom to make you succeed in wherever area you are working in. Look at Hanani. God has favored me. We know him by Shadrach. In, in the Babylonian, it means the great scribe. So could we read it, God has favored me to be the great scribe? Look, look at Meshach. Who is of what God is? Or who is God? Who is this God? Could it be possible that Nebuchadnezzar clarified it and said, he is the one who draws out with force? Look at the next one, Azariah. Jehovah has helped me, Abednego, to be a servant light or a servant of the light or a shining servant, however you want to say it. You see, when God started with their identity, Nebuchadnezzar thought he could change and turn it into something different. What he didn't realize just like the Sadducees, the scribes, and the enemy didn't know. Had they known they would have never crucified the Lord of glory, this is the same idea. Had they known what they were doing with these four boys, maybe they would have reconsidered. Because they're taken from the place of birth, from Jerusalem, thrown into a culture of decadence, immorality, and decay. And God says, let me have the last word with these four boys. And God is going to have his last word with his church in this last hour that you and I are living in. So if you're going through whatever you're going, trust me, don't abandon your post. Don't abandon what God has called you to do. Don't let the enemy rewire and reshape your platform God has given you. God has taught you how to draw from the hidden or the depths of the depths of wisdom to the mysterious wisdom, which is the terminology of a war council so that at the proper time he may disclose what God's strategy is for the face of the earth and he will use those that you think you don't understand. Culture has gone through difficult situations. Throughout history, the church has gone through difficult situations. You can check, I don't remember the dates. I think it was in the 1700s, if I'm not mistaken. But Christianity was forbidden, and they, they were for, forbidden people to preach the gospel. You know what God did? God raised this little group of boys and, and girls, little ones, like that little, maybe younger. And they were called the, the little prophets. And they would go around prophesying and healing the sick and doing all these miracles. What are you going to say to a kid? Put him in jail? Over what? God has more answers for us. But what he requires out of you and I is to develop this attitude, three attitudes that were able to release the supernatural in the life of these four boys. Look with me at verse 17 of that same chapter. As for these four youth, God gave them knowledge, intelligence, and every branch of literature, wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of dreams and visions. This guy could read your mail. 
Would you agree? I mean, verse 20. And as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the, the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians, conjurers who were in this realm. He gives them three years to learn their language of the Chaldeans, and in three years, they are ten times better wiser than everybody else what's going on with them they are giving themselves to the identity that God has given them they're not compromising the assignment they're not trying to to rewrite who God made them to be does it come with a price absolutely Is it difficult? Absolutely. Because there will be seasons where they will be tested. How many of you have ever been tested and and you need an answer yesterday and God comes right at the very last? (sighs) No one experienced that. But you know what God did? And these boys... They put their ability to be tested. In fact, they come to their superiors and, and listen to what they said because they came in verse 12 and said, listen, please test your servants for 10 days. Just give me some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Man, I would have not made it. They were willing to be tested. Look at verse 15. And at the end of the 10 days, their appearance seemed better. They were fatter than all the youths who had been calling for the king's choice food. It seemed to me that what they were feeding in was better and greater than what they were feeding in at the king's table so while the world was trying to feed one thing they were feeding into something else and it made them even wiser in the ability to be tested you see you and i need to be okay with being tested and we all struggle with that idea how many of you love to be tested i know you don't But why would would James say, count it? All joy. When you go through these things, they are for the testing of your... 1 Corinthians 10 says it this way. There is no temptation that is overtaking you such as it is common to man... I'll let you read the rest of the verse. Why would God allow this testing? Because he knew that these four boys were able to pass the test and ace the test. And he knows that whatever you go through, if you stay focused on your assignment, focus on what God has called you to do, you will pass the test. These four boys, I call them boys because they were, at this point in time, are able to tap into something that is making them shine or go to the top in a wicked culture. It seems to me that maybe we need that today. You know what's amazing out of this? Is that they have become influencers In a foreign land. I don't want to depress anybody, but if you go to hopper.com, well, I don't want to give you all my secrets. But but they there's a study there of how much each influencer 
makes per Instagram post. Now, let me just give you some numbers. How many of you have ever heard of The Rock? Everybody's going like this. Dwayne Johnson. He happens to make $760,000 per post. I would write three a day. Maybe four. No, why settle for less? You can look at the numbers. It's crazy. But you know what? They've cre- created a platform for business that is foreign to most of us. Could it be that maybe they're ahead of, they're changing the cycles of business and we're kind of like, I'm in the old Like, help me understand Facebook. (laughs) It's interesting because these boys are now going to the top. They've become influencers. And and look at chapter 5, if you would. Chapter 5 of the book of Daniel. And I want you to look at these two verses. Because this is what they saw in them, and this is what the world sees in you, and this is what the enemy is trying to squelch in you. Verse 11, there was a man in your kingdom in whom a spirit of the holy gods, now remember, these are unsaved kings, in the days of your father, that illumination insight and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him and king nebuchadnezzar your father your father's the king appointed him chief of the magicians conjurers chaldeans and diviners i'll let you sort out that theology okay but look at the next verse because this is what's amazing this was he was above all this Watch this. This was because he had, someone help me, an extraordinary spirit and knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and soul solving difficult problems were found in this Daniel in whom the king Belshazzar let Daniel be summoned and he will declare the interpretation. It tells me that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to solve the enigmas of the culture of that day. What if we started believing for a release of the spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge and God wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, here's the answer to how to heal the coronavirus. Think about it. What if? What if in the middle of the night, God says, wake up. I want to give you four or five symbols, those of you in the financial markets, and and I want you to short this stock. I want you to do these options, and I want you to buy this, and I want you to sell it in 10 days. And by the way, so that you don't have any tax, tax consequences, I want you to deed those securities to a 501c3 by the name of Encourage Your Church. I'm saving you taxes here. <laughs> now think about it. I know I'm, it's fun, but, but think about what if we were willing to say, God, why should w- the world have answers when we have the Spirit of God that allows us to go into the depths of the depths of wisdom and allow us to access the mysterium, the mysteries of the war council, so that at the right time we speak the right words? What if? What if God is waiting for these people to say, here I am, God? You know, I uh, go, go back to chapter 2, because it seems to me that God puts a lot of urgency into these chapters. Or not God, I should say, Daniel experiences urgencies. I, I met with people, 
And I meet with people because I, I, I still do quite a bit of counseling. And, and it's fine because I, I don't mind it. But, you know, there are people wondering, what is my calling? What am I called to do? What am I on this earth about? What's my next assignment? How many of you have ever felt like it's just super quiet? And like you're not getting answers. Have you ever felt that? Welcome to the club of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because this king, Nebuchadnezzar, has a dream. And the Bible says that he is deeply disturbed. He has an emergency. Look at verse 1. Now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Would you say he had a sleepless night? You and I would say he had a demonic dream. But maybe God was speaking. You know, when I read these chapters, I'm wondering, why did you give the dreams to these wicked people? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Could it be because the righteous were right there to interpret them? I'm just saying. Because we're kind of shifting the culture differently. And so, I love verse 5. Then the, clean, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me this dream, its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made Ash heaps. That's encouraging, isn't it? Would you say there's an urgency there? I mean, there's no, I'll take this one, I'll take that. If you don't interpret this, you're toast. Like, you're not here tomorrow. But you know what? It seemed to me that even in the middle of the silence... Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have learned to acquire the ability to go and, de and go deep into the depths of God. The Bible says, deep calls unto deep. And they're able to go into the mystery or mysterian of wisdom and say, God, at the appointed time, this is revealed because this is going to be revealed later on. Now, if I don't have an answer, God, by tomorrow, I'm toast. So you know what they do? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel have learned the lesson of intercession. And I will say to you, it is a lesson that we need to recover again in the body of Christ. Because if you read chapter 2, verses 16, all the way through 18... Daniel is smart. He goes to his three buddies and he says, guys, I'm going to be toast tomorrow. No more Daniel. Are you going to miss me? I don't know. He'd, I don't think he'd give him a guilt trip. But the Bible says they started seeking God. You go back to the book of Acts chapter 4. They were about to kill Christians. And they get into this prayer meeting. And, and, and here's the prayer. God, behold, they're threatening us. They want to kill us. Grant us that we may speak your word with boldness. By the way, stretch forth your hand to do signs and wonders in the middle of all of this. When they finish praying as a house, the Bible says that the house shook and they were filled with boldness. I'm taking story after story after story of what intercession and corporate prayer does. So these guys get into this prayer meeting, and Daniel gets a thought. 
You know, sometimes you dismiss your thoughts. I had this idea this week. I said, God, what do you want me to speak? I do that every week. And God said, compare these names. And I'm like, God, I, I, I kind of know the names. No, there's something hidden there. So you know what I did? I've learned that much. That when there's a thought that comes your way, you're not that brilliant. I mean, you're brilliant. You're intelligent. But, but maybe God has a greater mystery he wants to give you. So when your kids come to you with mom, dad, I have this idea. Don't shut them down that quick. Just give them some room. They may have a better idea than yours. So I did, and that's why I wanted you to see this. But here's what happens. They go into prayer, and look at chapter 2. Verse 19, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Isn't that something? He's got a vision at night, and he has the whole interpretation of this dream. And the interpretation is not a good interpretation for the king anyway. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Watch this. Daniel answered and said, let the name of God. God be blessed forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to him. And he is he who changes times and seasons. He removes kings, establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise men, knowledge to the men of understanding. And I love verse 22. This is the key for me. He who reveals the profound, this is what we read in 1 Corinthians 2, the profound hidden things, he knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells in him. Watch this. He has a vision and God says, I'm going to take you to the depths of, of the depths of the wet depths, which is the hidden wisdom. And you're going to pull it out, and you're going to make it a mysterium wisdom. You're going to reveal the strategy to the king, because I dwell in the light. Daniel gives the answer, saves his life, and in the process of saving his life, God promotes him, even though the result for Nebuchadnezzar is not a good result. Tell me if God's not in the middle of all of this. Tell me of the mess that you see out in the world that is happening, the church does not have an answer to. I think the church does. And I'm going to tell you what I'm believing. God, do a great move of revival. And you know what? I'm asking God to use the millennials, the younger people, to do signs and wonders that no one can understand. I remember getting saved when I was young. I remember going to this island, and, you know, I thought it was a party island. How many of you? Well, no, I'm not going to go there. But I did. It was in Vancouver, and, and I'm going to this island, and I'm thinking it's a weekend of fun. Okay, don't preach for me. I was trapped for seven days. It was not a fun week of what I thought it would be. It was in Vancouver. But I heard the gospel every night. And I'm thinking, are you telling me Jesus is alive? They told me he's dead. In fact, I don't even want to go to church because all I see, I, I get spooked. And the, I remember that week, I said, God, if you're real, I give you my life. And the preacher said, if you really mean it, stand up. I stood up. 
If you really mean it, come up front. You know what? I didn't have any hesitations because I went from one day doing all these crazy things to never again touching those things. I didn't even understand what happened to me. All I knew is that whoever was living inside of me at this point in time, I have no clue what's happened to me, is greater than the experiences I'm experiencing outside. And then they told me, no, it's God that lives inside of you, and the one that lives inside of you is greater than the one that's outside of, of, of in this world. And I thought, oh, okay, didn't understand the thing. <laughs> but what these guys do, after they have revealed the mystery, look at chapter 2, verse 48. Then the king appointed or promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and a chief uh, prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. I love Daniel. He does not forget his friends. Can I tell you, when you come into power, don't forget those that have helped you. Watch this. And Daniel made a request and said to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was in the, court, in the king's court. What just happened with all of this? They have solved the question, will God answer me? Is God enough to provide for me? You've got to think about the emergency they are in. They are in the emergency that if you don't give me an answer, they chop me tomorrow. And I know that people, you and I get there sometimes. You're saying, God, if you don't answer today, I, I, I'm going to be. How many of you have ever been in that situation? I need an answer. Maybe it's, it's choosing a job. Maybe it's you have options. You know, sometimes the more difficult situations is when you have more than one option. Because you don't know what to choose. And I'm just saying that God is, is speaking to Daniel, releasing Daniel, giving him the mysterion, and giving him the hiddenness of wisdom. And in the process of doing that, he is teaching these four boys that they will go to the highest places in a culture of wickedness and decadence. Amazingly enough, when you study this, they served three of the longest administrations in Babylon. They, ser they served Nebuchadnezzar. They served Belshazzar. They served da uh, Darius. Later on, right when Daniel, I don't know how old he is, but he's up in years. You know, he has this thought. And he remembers, I remember Jeremiah prophesied about this. Can you imagine? You're in your older year, 170 years have passed from the day Jeremiah uttered a prophetic word in Jeremiah 25. Think about this. A thought comes to his head. And he says, I remember. So I went to the writings of Jeremiah. And he says, God, again, he goes back to the spirit of intercession. He said, God, you said through the prophet Jeremiah that at the end of 70 years of captivity, your people go free. I've done the math, and listen, we are right at the 70th year. So I am imploring that you release your people. By the way, he goes into the spirit of intercession. You know what he does? He says, God, there's no record that, that, that Daniel has sinned in the whole book of Daniel. But he says, God, forgive us. For we have sinned against you. We have abandoned you. And the list goes on and on and on. 
in Daniel chapter 9. But you know what God did? God heard the cry of a righteous man and released a whole nation through Cyrus and Darius to rebuild the temple. He fulfilled his promise because this old man Remember something that was written a hundred some years later. Don't discount your thoughts and ideas because it might very well be a God idea that God's given you to bring freedom to somebody else. Amen. Daniel said it this way. In the last days, those that shine brightly will shine like the stars of heaven. And those that lead the many to righteousness will shine even like the expanse. And many will be found in the book. I wonder what book is he talking about? Think about it. We should be a church of evangelism. Through visions, prophetic dreams, using the prophetic. We've tried it enough in a safe place here. Let's try it in the world. People need that. People are hungry for it. They see it on you. And all we want to do is keep it safe. I'm telling you, the world needs a manifestation of the kingdom of God on the face of the earth. So here's how I close. I pray this is another man who's praying and saying, I pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge in him be given to you. That your spirituals, that your eyes may see the glorious inheritance that you have in him. You read verse 18 and 19 of Ephesians 1, and he says that you have been seated far above all principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and he is the head over all the enemies, and you are the body. It seems that we're connected. It seems that I have access to the depths of wisdom It seems that I have access to the mysterium of wisdom. It seems that those ideas that I have might very well be God's ideas. It seems that the world sees a spirit of wisdom and insight inside of me that maybe I don't see because the enemy is trying to rewrite who I am. Listen, if you think you're too old, Think about this. Moses started his call when he was 80 years old. Whew. Caleb took his mountain when he was 80 years old. At the end of Moses' life, at 120, he says, my sight is just as good today as it was when I came out of Egypt. I'm ready to go home. And he just falls asleep. Pretty good end, I would think. You know, and this is my true story. I'm not asking you to do this. Well, I don't do it this way. I do it in bed, holding my pillow, fellowshipping with my pillow. But but I do it every night. I lay down and I say, God, thank you for this day. Should this be the night that I get to see your beautiful face, I've served you all my years that I have. I know they're asking me to go see Pablo. But should this be the night, let me see your eyes, the first thing I see. The one I've loved 
all my walk with you. And then Monday morning comes. <laughs> and you're like, what happened? What? Live your day as if it was the last day and stop playing games and let's tap into the future of what God has for the church.